Appearances are sometimes deceiving. Sometimes what people see on the outside is not an accurate reflection of what's on the inside. We have taken this to ourselves in the form of a proverb, and we have said in our culture that you should not judge the book by the cover. Now, I might qualify that to some extent. Many times the book cover is a good indication of what is, is on side, inside. In fact, they're designed to be an indication of what is inside. When I think about the Bible, what it says in Proverbs chapter 20, it says, even a child is known by his doings. It is, it is absolutely natural that people will judge us and judge others on the basis of how they behave, what is in their heart. And so sometimes it is accurate to judge by what's on the cover. But there are other aspects of us, of each individual, that sometimes are not reflective. In other words, people may see the outside and not understand what really is on the inside. I think of one example of that from, our, from history and the story of a man by the name of William Wilberforce. Anybody know who William Wilberforce was? He was an English statesman, sat in the House of Parliament, and uh, was the one man that was most influential in the banishing of slavery in the British Empire. Uh, William Wilberforce was a powerful man of politics in his day, but yet he was a man who was very small in size and rather sickly. In fact, one of the other politicians of his day was a man by the name of Boswell, and Boswell said when he first saw William Wilberforce stand to speak, he saw a shrimp stand on the stage. But as he continued to listen to him speak, he said, I saw the shrimp become a whale. And so here is a man whose size did not project the power of his personality. Well, this may be somewhat true of you as well. Have you ever looked around in a crowd and seen one person who just didn't look like they fit? Who just didn't seem to be characteristic of the others in the group? Sometimes they get pushed to the margins. They get excluded from the uh, center of the fellowship because they're different, because they're not like us. Have you ever been in a situation where there was a character like that in the group? Have you ever been that person who just didn't seem to be accepted because they didn't fit the appearances? Well, today I want to talk to you, and hopefully the Word of God will be an encouragement as we talk about Paul, the weak apostle. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in the Word of God this morning. I thank you that you have given it to us today, that we can have absolute confidence as we read it here, that it is you who speak through these words to the hearts of your people. I thank you for each person that you've gathered here. I thank you for the fellowship of faith. And Father, if there's anybody here that's not a believer, help them understand their need to trust Christ as their Savior now while there is time and be born again. And Father, for those that are believers, the majority of the folks here, I believe, I pray you'd help us, Lord, to be more equipped to stand for you in this evil day and having done all to stand. We pray for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul had ministered in the city of Corinth before. You know that he had been there for a year, uh, for a year and a half and had started the church that is being written to in this book. After he had left, some trouble crept in the church. And so he had to write his first book of 1 Corinthians to them in part to deal with that trouble. Now we know from reading the book of 2 Corinthians that the people of Corinth responded well to his rebuke. They responded, it says, with zeal and indignation. And they cleared themselves of the accusation that was made against them. The church as a whole responded to the word of God spoken through the Apostle Paul by inspiration. We've studied 1 Corinthians. We've studied 2 Corinthians up to this point. And you understand that these things that I'm saying are true. However, it's also true that although the church at large responded well to the Apostle Paul's ministry, that there were some in that group, some Christians in that church, some in that area who did not receive the Apostle Paul's ministry. It is to those that he is writing in this section of, of Scripture in which he is encouraging them to understand the validity of his claims to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they did not accept it. And in part, we know they did not accept it because of what they esteemed Paul to be on the basis of his appearance. Tonight, this morning, I want you to see three things in our text. The first thing I want you to see is what Paul's appearance was. 
Let's look at Paul's appearance. It says this in verse 7. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Well, the reality is that we do. We estimate the value of a person on their good looks, on their, the strength of their personality, on how well they speak, on how well they interact with others, how smooth they are, how cool they are. And we make our judgments upon them on the outward appearance. That's a truth. However, the Bible instructs us that it's not the outward appearance that God judges. In fact, God looks deeper. He looks down in the very heart of man to see what a man really is. The Apostle Paul was a man who uh, was descended of the Israelites, of course, of the Old Testament. And there's a story that's given to us in the Old Testament about uh, King David. When he was first called to be that great king of Israel, the Bible tells us God had, been, God had given Jesse the prophet the command to go out and find the son of Jesse, uh, or excuse me, Samuel the prophet, the command to go and find the son of Jesse to anoint to be the next king. When he got there, Jesse brought out his oldest son, Eliab. And when Eliab came out there, Jesse said, This must be Lord's anointed. He's so tall. He's so strong. He's so good looking. But God said, No, that's not the one. And in fact, God says this verse in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7 it says, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And my friends, we are told and taught throughout Scripture that what God sees is not the projection that you make in front of other people, but the very truth that sits in the hearts, in the depths of your own heart. David would write later in Psalms, Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And my friends, the un unblinking eye of God can see into the very heart of every single man and see what lies inside. But we have a tendency to look at the outside. And so we make our judgments upon what we see on the outward appearance. Paul recognizes that this is nat natural. But he wants to challenge him on that thought here a little bit this morning. Second Corinthians chapter 10, it says, Do you look on things after the, after the outward appearance? The problem was, as it is in our day, also in Corinth. They had this tendency to look at things on the outward, uh, from the outward appearance. And this was the way some of them had judged the Apostle Paul. My friends, we have suggestions in Scripture that the Apostle Paul's outward appearance was not very attractive. Here is the man that God has chosen. Yes, the man that we know from history would do more than any other person to propagate the gospel of Christ and the kingdom of God throughout the world. We owe, even here today in 2013, a debt of gratitude to the Apostle Paul for his missionary endeavors carrying the gospel across the Straits of Bosphorus into Europe and then uh, down through the years into our day and age and giving us so much of the New Testament. And yet this was a man that if you saw him, you would not select him to be the most likely to do God's work. In fact, you see in our text in verse 10, it says his letters, they say they are waiting and powerful. But listen, my friends, but his bodily presence is weak. Literally, if you're reading that in the Greek, it would say the coming of his body is weak. The coming of his body. When his body comes, when he opens the door, when he steps into your presence, you are not impressed with the outward appearance of the Apostle Paul. Here are some things that we can infer from Scripture. At the time that he wrote this, in about AD 60, he was no longer a young man. He had passed his prime. Now, I don't want to offend anybody here. But we think the Apostle Paul was probably about 30 when he was involved in the martyrdom of the, of the, Apostle, or of the, the deacon Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. He was probably about 30. He was called a young man that day. 
And young men would have been in their 30s. That would be when a man really starts to live his own independent life under the Jewish scheme, begins to really serve and minister, particularly if he was a rabbi or someone involved in the religious traditions. And so we think the Apostle Paul may have been about 30. Now that was when, the, when Stephen was, was stoned. Now it's many, many more years later, and now he's probably approaching 60 years of age. That's not young. I wasn't going to say old. That's not young anymore. That's after you've reached your prime and passed it. And someone told me once that once you enter your 40s and your 50s, that's when everything starts to fall apart. <laughs> and you start having trouble. You get up in the morning and your joints ache and your muscles ache and it's hurting. It takes more pain and more energy to do the things that you used to do. Now it's past the time of your life. They say that uh, a man's most productive years are in his 40s and 50s. The Apostle Paul at this point is probably at the tail end of that, if not already into his 60s. Not a young man by anybody's estimation anymore. We know probably from the Word of God what it tells us that he is probably a man who is physically scarred. Look with me, if you will, in chapter 11, the next chapter in verse 25. It, he's telling a little bit about his life, and he says this, Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, and I might add here, and left for dead. Thrice I suffered ship, or shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. We only know of one time he suffered shipwreck. He said he suffered it three times. A night and a day in the deep indicates that he was adrift in the ocean. This is a man whose life had been hard. And you know and I know the more we endure suffering in our lives, the more the toll takes upon our body. This was a man who probably was physically scarred. Maybe he limped. Maybe he moved with great pain. Maybe there were physical marks upon his skin and his flesh where the stones had broken his skin and he had suffered and bled for Christ. The scars may have made him unattractive. Men who study the Word of God think the Apostle Paul may have had an eye problem. For us, the Apostle Paul dictated several of his letters. And then when he did take a pen in hand, a quill to write his own ending the letter, he would say things like in Galatians, you see how large a letter I've written in my own hand, indicating that perhaps he couldn't see well. And so when he wrote, he wrote with large letters. And so this is a man whose eyesight perhaps was failing him. He would have probably read like this. He probably would have peered into your face to try to see who you were. Some people suggest he may have had an eye disease and perhaps his eyes were always bloodshot and red and, he, and they, they bothered him, itched or, 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 or they stung. Perhaps even they drained because of the disease. We don't know for sure, but the suggestion has been made. The interesting thing is we actually have a description of the Apostle Paul from outside of Scripture. There was a fictional story written about Paul in about AD 150. That's less than 100 years after this book of 2 Corinthians was written. It was a fictional story called The Acts of Paul and, uh, and Thecla. And Thecla was a young lady, and Paul was a man who had a great influence on her in the story to live a life of virtue for the Lord. And in this uh, story about Paul and Thecla, by the way, it was a very popular story. It's translated into four or five different languages and has been retranslated, has been translated into English in different ways. But in that very first chapter, there's a description given of the Apostle Paul less than 100 years after he lived, probably based upon the stories of those who had been eyewitnesses of Paul's life. In other words, people who lived during Paul's life, told their children about it, and they might have been the ones who wrote this story. Here's what is said of the Apostle Paul. It says this, He was a man of little stature, thin-haired upon his head. And we all take great consolation in that. Thin-haired upon his head, crooked in the legs, with knees projecting. He had large eyes, with eyebrows meeting. The teenagers, that's a unibrow. You guys have heard of that, right? He had large eyes with eyebrows meeting and with a nose somewhat hooked. Now, my friends, that doesn't sound to me like the description of the most handsome young man in your class, does it? This is a guy that maybe 
when it comes to looks, was not so blessed. He was small, knobby need, had a unibrow, and his eyes were, 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 were large. His nose was long and hooked. He was almost bald. And you know, this is, a, this is a culture, remember, in Greece, in Corinth, that very much idolized human beauty. Go back and look at the, arc, the art, look at the sculpture from those days. Whenever they tried to portray the, uh, the man or portray the woman in those days, always in terms of ideal form, it was always as though the Greek men and the women were carved out of marble, chiseled with muscle. And into that kind of a culture, here comes the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel of Christ. And so many people said, when it comes to, the, to his body, his bodily presence, not impressive. Weak. Moreover, the Bible tells us about the Apostle Paul that, I should say this, he was no Adonis. He was just a Average or less than average looking man. More the Bible tells us about the Apostle Paul when it comes to his, to his outward appearance that his verbal presence was also contemptible. You see in verse 10, his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. You know, we talked about William Wilberforce, a man who stood up and appeared to be a shrimp, but when he began to speak, he spoke with such fluency and such oratory that he was able to impress even the great Boswell. But it appears that was not true of the Apostle Paul. They said the Apostle Paul, his speech is contemptible. I'm not sure exactly what this means, but it, mean that it means, what, what we know it means is that when he spoke, people despised his speech. Now, why was it? Well, I don't know. Maybe that suggests some things. Perhaps he, spoke with a, perhaps he spoke with a weak voice. You know, some people are blessed with great voices. You know, when they speak, they sound like they're, they've got the radio voice. You know, they sound like they just command attention. And then other people just don't have the tenor, the fiber, the timbre of voice to make that kind of an impression with their natural ability. Maybe that was it with the Apostle Paul. We do know this, that he was lowly in his projection of himself. Look at verse 1 of this chapter, chapter 10 and verse 1. You remember what it says there? Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you. That means in presence I am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. It has to do with the idea of humility, of being at the bottom. If you were to choose somebody to make the speech, Paul would probably not be the one you would choose. He was humble in his projection. It might have been that he was unable to think on his feet. You know, when you get, get up and give a speech, unless you just read it word for word, which is what some people do, you have to a certain amount of, uh, to a certain uh, level, be able to think on your feet, to be able to answer questions, to be able to deal with issues as they come up. And it may have been that that was something the Apostle Paul just did not excel with. You notice that he says here that his letters are weighty, which indicates that when he had time to think about an issue, when he was in a quiet place, he's writing out letter, he's able to process the thoughts and create a great argument. But when it comes to the actual, actual speaking, not so much. So it probably, it could have been at least that he was not able to think well on his feet. And so he stumbled. He, he, he stuttered. He had trouble thinking about what to say. Whatever it was, it says here, when people heard him, his speech was contemptible, my friends. He was no Demosthenes. And just as the people of Greece uh, valued the perfect human beauty, they also held in very high regard the ability to excel at oratory. In fact, Demosthenes, I just mentioned him, is still to this day considered one of the greatest speak, speech makers that's ever lived. He lived about 300 years before this had happened, before this letter was written. There were a number of great speech makers. The Romans had their Cicero. 
In Greece, they had what they called the can of ten. These were the ten attic speakers. And they were known for being the best at speaking up till that day. And today are still remembered for their ability to speak. And this was something that those who were training for, uh, for high levels of education, they would spend years in learning how to prepare and deliver a speech for maximum impact. That's what the Corinthians expected. That's what Greeks looked for. That's what they valued. And here came the Apostle Paul. And for whatever reason, perhaps some of the, some, some of the ones we've mentioned here, the Bible tells us his speech was contemptible. You know, Paul, from the outward appearance, could have been said to be a weak apostle. Could have been said to be a poor choice to do the work that God had called him to. But I remind you, it was God who called him. And there's a great truth here for us, brothers and sisters, because I suppose every single one of us is weak in some areas. There are some areas that we feel our lack of ability. And yet every single one of us has been called to minister for the cause of Jesus Christ. We talked about that all through 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. God has called every single person who has trusted Christ as their Savior, who has received the gift of eternal life, to be involved in the cause of Christ. And so many people say, but pastor, I don't have ability. I can't speak. Or I don't attract people. I don't know how I could serve Christ. I could never be an Apostle Paul. But perhaps we have a wrong impression of who Paul was and perhaps we have a wrong impression of who his God was and who our God is. Because I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the Lord hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the mighty and the simple things to confound the wise. This was no accident that the Apostle Paul was this way. It was the choice of God. Men look at the outward appearance, but my friends, God look at the heart. Now Paul is going to take that truth, the truth that people do look at the outward appearance, it's just our nature, and use it to challenge them with regard to their thinking about Him. He says this in the in verse 7, If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. Let me say this first of all. He is writing, he's speaking here to those who trust in themselves that they are Christ. In other words, they have a confidence within themselves that they belong to Jesus. And I want to just park here for a moment and say, it is possible for you and for me to be confident that we belong to Jesus. Absolutely is possible. There are a lot of people out in the world that say, no, you shouldn't say that. You shouldn't say for sure that you're saved. You shouldn't say, I know that I'm saved because you can't be sure you belong to Jesus. Well, the Bible tells us in 1 John verse 5, chapter 5, verse 13, these things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. And God has given us clear promises of Scripture so that if we will seize on those promises, we can be sure upon the nature of God Himself that we are indeed saved. When the Bible says it so simply, whosoever believeth on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved, we can believe that we are saved. When the Bible says that whosoever believeth on me shall not perish but have everlasting life, we can be sure that we have everlasting life. When the Bible says he that believeth on him shall not be ashamed, we can be sure that there will never be a day when we will regret having trusted Jesus as our Savior. My friends, if we are trusting in Christ, we can say upon the confidence of God's Word, we are sure that we know we're going to heaven. People say, well, that's just arrogant to say that. 
It's only arrogant if you base your salvation upon your own works. If you say, if I'm good enough, I'll get to heaven. If I continue to be good enough, I get to heaven. Then you would be arrogant to say, well, look at me. Look how good I've done. I'm surely going there. But our salvation is not based on our works. It's based upon the finished work of Christ and the promises that God has made to that Christ in his finished work that if we trust in him for our salvation, we will be saved. In fact, I've said this before and I'll suggest it again. We would be more arrogant to say, we're not sure if God's word is true or of his promises are real and so we're not really sure if we're saved that would be the height of arrogance humility says if god says it i believe it and so i want to tell you every single one of you here today you can have confidence beyond a shadow of a doubt that you know for sure you belong to jesus it's based on the promises of god's word now it's fortified by your actions and the Bible teaches us that if we act like we're saved, we're going to have more assurance. If we act like we're not saved, we're going to be filled with doubts. That's a fact. The Bible tells us this throughout Scripture. But ultimately, it's not based upon our action. It's based upon our confidence that God has not lied to us when He says that we can have eternal life by trusting in Jesus. I just love the fact here that he writes to people who trust to themselves that they are Christ. Now, he says to them, If any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again. Now, my friends, when, we, when he's saying that, he's saying, I want you to think about that statement again. Your confidence that you are in Christ is based not on how good you are, not on how righteous you are, not on how perfect your service is, but upon your faith in Jesus. And if it is true that you and I can be confident of our salvation in spite of our sins, in spite of our faults, in spite of our errors. And the Apostle Paul says, I know my outward appearance ain't so much, but you can be sure that we also are Christ because it is about our faith and not the outward appearance. Listen, everyone fails to live for Christ. I, I, I am more and more conscious of this the older I get in my walk with Christ. I'm more and more conscious that every day I fall short of serving the Lord like I ought to. So many times I'm trying to offer that cup of water in God's name, the name of Jesus, and that cup is, of water is tainted with mud. That's my flesh. It's my selfishness. It's my own ego. So often I want to bring the sacrifices of a pure heart to God, but I bring that which is diseased and offer it upon the sacrifice to a holy God. And I don't know, I can't tell you how many times I just before God, almost on a daily basis, sometimes more than daily, say, Lord, I don't do this very well. I don't do the work of the ministry very well. I failed you here. I'm faulty here. I can't do this well, but Lord, I need you to do it for me. And I need you to do it through me. And the beauty of it is that the more we recognize how faulty our service is, how insufficient, how imperfect, how tainted it is, the more we come to just trust Jesus to do it for us. That's been my experience. That even if I don't preach a message very well, even if my thoughts are jumbled, even if I can't make a point, even if I haven't spent the time in preparation that I should, or procrastinated, or I've been lazy, that God can still work through me. And I depend on Him. Now let's be careful to make sure we never make God's grace an excuse to not do what we should but when we recognize our failing, recognize that once more we have done less than we should, let's seize upon the grace of God and pull it to ourselves a balm for our wounds and say, thank God, it's not by me and it's not about me. Paul says, if you trust that you are Christ, and that has to be a confidence based not upon our abilities, but upon Christ." then think this as well. Yes, our speech may be contemptible. 
Yes, our appearance may be weak. Maybe we don't speak as boldly as we should. Maybe we don't prepare ourselves like we should. But thank God, no matter how muddy the waters of our service or how diseased the sacrifices of our worship, we belong to Christ. And we can believe that with all of our hearts. Even so are we Christ. So my friends, the outward appearance is not the important part. Secondly, I want you to see in our text here Paul's authority. We saw his appearance. Now look at his authority. Paul says this in verse 9. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by, uh, by letters. The Apostle Paul may not have had a lot of appearance. He may not have made a great show when he preached. He may not have impressed people with his ability. But the one thing the Apostle Paul had, without doubt, was authority. It was authority given to him by God. Look with me back, if you will, to Acts chapter 26. And let's hear a recounting of the Apostle Paul's authority as he shares it with us himself. He shares it actually in this text with King Agrippa who is the Herod of that day, if you will. He's sitting, his Herod Agrippa is sitting as the king of that area. And as he tells his story many years later of his conversion, he says this, beginning in verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. You recognize the context. He's been smitten off his horse by this blind, blinding light on the road to Damascus. He recognized that, recognizes that God is speaking to him. And so he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord identifies himself as this same Jesus who Paul was determined to destroy. And Paul trusts in Christ here. But look, listen to verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Paul was given a direct commission here. He was given authority by God to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, among whom were the Corinthians, and bring them the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul had no doubt that even though the appearances would not have made him a good candidate, God had given him authority to preach the word. Now may I stop here, my friends, and say this, brothers and sisters, we too have been given authority. Not by a voice from heaven, but by a voice from this word. I take note of the fact that the Apostle Paul here uses the plural. He says this, though I should boast somewhat more of our authority which the lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction i should not be ashamed now why would he say our and us because he's not speaking of himself only but he's speaking of those also with whom he ministered there were a group of men that he had gathered with him to, to help him in the ministry there was timotheus there was titus there was aristarchus segundus and gaius and other men that he had gathered with him and all of them had a part in ministering the gospel to these gentiles now they were not all called by a voice from heaven but they were all called by virtue of their salvation through jesus christ and his precious word and so too have you and i if you have received the glorious light of Jesus Christ, you ought to be a conduit for that light to be carried into the lives of others around you. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20 were not spoken directly to you, but they were recorded in Scripture because it was to be understood that this applies to every single believer. When Jesus said to his disciples on top of the mount, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That, my friends, that great commission is for you. It's for me. We have a job to do. 
And by the way, it wasn't just the 11 disciples on top of that mount who took that commission and ran with it. Yes, they were there at Pentecost, but there were also 121 others, 100, 111 others, 101 others as well. I don't know. You, you figure out the math. There were others there as well. 120 altogether, subtract 11. 109. Okay, there were others there as well. They also took that commission. In fact, when they were scattered, it says in Acts, it says they went everywhere preaching the word. And many years later, Paul would write, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart to be ready to always give an answer to every man that asketh your reason the hope that lies within you with meekness and fear. <coughs> Who is he writing that to? Believers everywhere. We have an authority. You say, but pastor, I don't feel that authority. Listen, the world will try to make you doubt your authority. Make no mistake. They will come to you and say, what do you know? What do you know? You don't have a degree in theology. And by the way, there's a lot of people with degrees in theology who are anti-Christian in their thinking. And their sole purpose is to try to undermine true believers who have a simple faith. They'll come along and they'll say, well, we're not sure about this Scripture. We're not sure if it even belongs there. We're not sure that we're interpreting it correctly. We suggest it means something else. Or maybe it was just added to the Bible later. And they'll come along and do everything they can to shake you. You don't, you don't know what you're talking about. What is wrong with you with your simple faith in Jesus? You're just one of those backwoods Bible believers, Bible thumping, knuckle dragging, whatever. They'll call you all kinds of things to try to get you to shut up talking about Jesus. One of their favorite tactics is to tell you, well, it's not appropriate right now. This is not appropriate in this form or this place. Don't talk about that here. That's not right. They'll try to shame you into stopping your witness for Jesus. They'll say, what do you know? Where's your authority? And I want to tell you something. You may not have been to classes like they may have. You may not have sat under professors like they have. You may not have read books like they have. You may not have written books like you have, but they have. But I want to tell you where your authority is. Your authority is that you were a witness of what happened. You were there when God saved you. They weren't. They were not there when God Presented to you the simple gospel of his substitution of his son Jesus for you. And the truth that if you placed your faith in him, you could be born again and have eternal life. They were not there when you placed your faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit came inside of you to begin to dwell, never to leave again. They have not been there in the moments after that when God began to give you grace, the grace of understanding God's word, the grace of a growing love for Jesus, the grace of a desire to please Him, the grace of overcoming sin in your life, the grace of answered prayer, the grace of victory, and all those intellectual, egg-headed, know-it-alls don't know a thing about what you have witnessed. You are an authority with regards to the reality of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't be afraid to stand and say it. You say, oh, pastor, I might not say it well. Don't worry about that. I may not say it loud enough, long enough, well enough, listen, God can take whatever you say, but don't let the forces of Satan shame you or cow you into not speaking what you know. Your, your authority is just as real. In fact, I would say it's more real, more powerful than anybody else's that you speak to about what's going on inside of you. You have given by God. And people may demean your appearance. They may call you names. They may ridicule you. What do you know? Science has proved the Bible wrong. <laughs> but you and I know that we have proved the Bible right. And we have authority. 
given to us by God. That authority has a purpose. It says in this verse, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction. In other words, God gives the authority to preach the gospel in order to build people up. And my friends, when you are working in the field of God's work and you're trying to share the gospel with people, keep in mind it is for their strengthening, it's for their edification to build them up, not to destroy them. It seems like many times when people begin to be offensive towards us, we can get defensive back. And what do we want to do? We want to win arguments. We want to win fights. We want to fight back. We want to destroy them, pulverize them. And maybe that's the reason why we don't. We feel like inadequate. You know, how can I deal with someone that knows so much more than I do? Listen, our point in any kind of an argument about God is not to destroy people. It's to win them to Jesus. And how do you do that? You just be yourself and trust in Christ. So Paul says, I have authority, but his authority did not mean he came into churches and he ground people under his foot. He beat them down because they weren't doing what they should be doing. Listen, it's true. There were many people who are not doing what they should be doing. That's true today. That's true in every single one of our hearts to some measure. But Paul's authority was given him to find the strengths and to build and to find the strengths, and to build, and to walk away with a church of stronger believers when it was over. And how does he do that? By coming in and saying, God has sent me with a message. This kind of uh, ministry given by God for the purpose of edification has a great legitimacy. Paul says this in the verse, if I should boast, or though I should boast somewhat more of our authority... I should not be ashamed. Though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, I should not be ashamed. In other words, my boasting is legitimate. It's not shameful. Listen, we say it sometimes this way. It's all, it's no brag. It's all fact. If what you're saying is true, it's legitimate. It's not just being arrogant. And Paul says, if I should boast somewhat more of my authority, if I should say, God gave me this authority, this authority makes you a stronger believer. If he boasted of his authority, he would not be ashamed of that because it was true. And by the way, the Apostle Paul is going to do some boasting here. I'll show you this just for a moment. Look at verse 12, uh, 13. Paul says this, But we will not boast ourselves of things without our measure, but... And I could insert here, we will boast ourselves according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us. Did you see how I put that in there? I'm not adding the scripture, I'm just simply substituting the subject for the first part as a subject for the second part. We will not boast of things beyond our measure, but we will boast about the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us. And he's going to do that. Look at, look at verse, chapter, verse 1. Wouldn't to God you would bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. Skip down to verse 13. Uh, verse uh, chapter 11 I'm sorry not 13 uh, verse 12 but what I do that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion and therein they glory I'm sorry that's not the one I'm looking for either um, I'm not sure where it was in there uh, well, so let's just go ahead and skip down to the next verse verse 16 it says this no man think me a fool if otherwise yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak and not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. And then it goes on here in a long passage and he talks about all the things that he had suffered and done for Christ. He is going to boast of his authority. But Paul says, even though I boast somewhat of my authority, I am not ashamed because this is a legitimate authority God has given to me. And that's says in this next verse, verse 9, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. In other words, I am not using my authority to come in and terrorize you. I'm coming in here by the power of God, given by God, the authority that I have to come in the church and to build you up. You know what terrorists are? Terrorists are enemies. Terrorists are not interested in building buildings. Terrorists are not interested in raising people back up to health and life. No, what's our experience? They like to tear down buildings. They like to kill people. That's what terrorists do because they're enemies. They don't have authority. 
But Paul says, I'm not coming in to terrify you. I'm coming with the authority of God to build you up. This authority, my friends, is legitimate. And I want to tell you, if you're going to stand and speak for Jesus, witness what you know, what you have learned from the Word of God, what the Holy Spirit has taught you and done for you, your authority is legitimate. I don't care what they say. Your authority is legitimate. So Paul says this, and let's just finish the text here. Paul uh, finishes with some assurances. We've seen his uh, appearances, his authority, and now his assurances. Paul says in verse 10, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one, someone who says this, let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. His letters are weighty and powerful. And Paul says, I want you to know this. When I come to you, I'm going to be involved in the work in the same way that I wrote these letters. In the same spirit, the same manner that I wrote these letters. I will not come to you in weakness. I will come to you with weighty and powerful words in, in the deed of the work and the ministry. I will not be, when I'm present with you, different than I am when I'm writing this letter being absent from you. I'm going to be the same way. I'm going to be consistent in my presentation. Now, the Apostle Paul, I think, is talking not about the outward appearance. In other words, he might come, he still might stumble over his words. He still might not look all that attractive on the outside. He's certainly not going to be able to change some of those things. But I think what he's saying is my heart, my heart will be the same. When I write the letters, my heart is to strengthen and build you up. When I come, I might not speak well, I might not look well, but my heart will be to strengthen and build you up. I'll have the same approach from the inside. And we don't have any record of what it was like when the Apostle Paul actually got there. And I'm aware of some debates, some people say there's actually a third letter to the Corinthians that's contained within the second letter. I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, I'm aware of those debates, so, but I, I don't think the Bible gives us any indication about what it was like when the Apostle Paul came. I don't know if he came in thundering. I don't know if he preached with great power like he wrote his letters. I don't know. But he assured them, when I come, I'm going to be just like I am when I write these letters. Now, here's the neat thing. I want to take a moment and exalt our God here. If I may, I shouldn't have to ask permission. That's why we gathered here on a Sunday morning was to worship God. But let's exalt him for a moment. I wonder if the Apostle Paul sometimes himself did not rue the fact that he did not make a great appearance. I wonder if there were times when the Apostle Paul said, Lord, I wish I were better looking. Not so I can pick up chicks or not like that, but so that I can be more presentable to the gospel. I would use my good looks for you, Lord, if you would allow me to have such a thing. By the way, there's nothing wrong with having a good appearance. That doesn't mean you're ungodly. It just means God has blessed you in that area. And if God has blessed you in, in your appearance, and you're a, a handsome young man or a beautiful young woman, I want to encourage you to surrender that to the Lord, to use it for His glory. But I wonder if the Apostle Paul ever had days said, Lord... I wish I weren't so ugly. I wonder if he didn't ever have days that said, Lord, I wish I could speak better. And I want to say to you, if you've got an ability for speaking, if you're able to put words together and think on your feet like that, and you're able to make a good impression as you speak, that's not a bad thing. It's a gift from God. And I encourage you as a pastor, as you prepare yourself to meet God someday, give it to Him and surrender it to use it for His glory. But I wonder if there weren't days the Apostle Paul said, Lord, please help me to learn to speak better. I wish I could minister better through my speech. But that wasn't his strength. And as far as we know, God never gave him those abilities. What was Paul's strength, by the way? Well, it says right in our text, writing letters. Look, if you will, over a little bit farther into chapter 11. Paul says this, verse 5, 
For I suppose that I was not a wit behind the very chiefest apostles. For though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest unto you in all things. Paul says, I might be rude in speech, but not knowledge. And I believe that was Paul's strength, by the way. He had an incisive understanding of God's gospel plan. And when he had the opportunity to sit down and to think it out in a quiet place with a pen and a piece of paper, dictating it to, a, to Amanusis, he was able to do it with great logical clarity. He was able to write powerful letters. But he wasn't a very good speaker. I wonder if the Apostle Paul didn't enter into heaven when he was finally done with his work here and come face to face with Jesus and all of a sudden realize why he was never a good speaker and realize why he never was all that good looking. Why was it? I think you can figure out in your own mind, can't you? Because he was not strong in his appearance, he focused on his letter writing. And because he focused on his letter writing, what happened? God gave us so much of the New Testament. And today, my friends, we are impacted by the Apostle Paul in Pocatello, Idaho, in 2013, in these days in which we live, more than we are impacted by any other of the apostles. Why didn't some of the apostles write letters? It may have been because they were good speakers. And they never felt the need to write letters because their speech was powerful. It may have been because of their appearance. It was effective in reaching people. We know they were all sold out, everything to Christ, and they gave it all for the Lord. But perhaps they never wrote letters because they never felt the need. God used them greatly in their pulpits. God used them greatly in their personal encounters. But they never wrote down anything that would endure beyond their lives and God never gave the scripture through many of the apostles. But through the apostle Paul, and because he was weak, he focused on his letter writing, which is where he was effective. And my friends, you and I are here today because of that. You know what I say? I say our God is a great and wise God. He is a great and wise God in his dealing with the Apostle Paul. And I want to personalize that to you and to me and say God is a great and wise God with your weaknesses and your strengths. And if you will just get on your knees and say, Lord, here I am. I'm a mixed bag at best. There are some things that I am weak at and there are some things that I know that I can do well. Lord, I'm a mixed bag, but I give you the whole bag. And I want you to use it for your glory. You'll wake up some mornings and you'll go to bed some nights and you'll say, Lord, I haven't done well today for you. But you can cling to the grace of God and say, Lord, I know that you know what you're doing with me. And I hope someday you and I can step in the presence of Jesus. And he can take us, turn us back so we can look back at our lives and we might begin to see where God was working and bringing himself great glory.